And there is tremendous excitement here in Zimini Stadium in Piastani for this final game of the 1987 World Junior Championship. Canada is assured of a medal. The color will be determined by the outcome of this game. Jerry Basson, an ideal situation for the Canadian team. They can determine their own fate. Without question, Donnie, it's a very simple. After that remarkable recovery by this young team, with its loss to the Czechs, all they got to do is throw and put more pucks in that Russian net than it goes in their own. Very simple. Forget all the formulas. Just go out and win the game. It is somewhat complicated, but let me say this. A victory by five goals over this Soviet team will assure Canada of the gold medal. Before we get the opening face-off, let's go back to Sports Weekend Control, and here's Terry Lyle. Back at Zimni Stadium in Piastani, the Soviet Union against Canada, the Soviet Union, in its last four games, has just one tie to show for its efforts. The Canadian team, after that loss to Czechoslovakia, a 5-1 score on Monday, has rebounded for consecutive victories, 18-3 over Poland. That 6-2 win over the United States, and 4-3 over Sweden. Now, if Canada wins this game by five goals following Finland's 5-3 win today over Czechoslovakia. Canada takes home the goal. A victory by Canada. Three goals or less means a silver medal. If Canada should win by four goals, it's a rather complicated procedure to determine whether it's the Finns or Canada that will get the gold medal. They would probably have to haul out the computers to determine which side gets the gold. The game is underway. Canada is assured of the bronze. The puck is fired in by the Soviets. Going back after it is Steve Shazon. He was out of the lineup, suspended for one game for his part in that brawl against the United States. Canada dumps it out into the center ice area, broken up by the Soviets. Osipov deflects it down into the Canadian zone, and Kerry Huffman is back. He rifles it around the boards into the center ice area to Elnick, the leading scorer, over to McElwain, and he is upset as he comes in across the line. Back on the Soviets. Pop off to Osipov into the center ice area. Picked up by the Canadians. And it's dumped back into the Soviet zone. Some good bumping early in this game as the Canadians attempt to gain control in that Soviet end of the ring. They continue the battle behind the net. Canada with some strong court. Now goal off the stick of Shanahan. And that was steered to the corner by Ivan Inkov. Pinching in from the point, Honda keeps it in. And now the Soviets gain control and they start back up. Osipov dodges the check, in across the line, he gets it again, and it's knocked off the stick. Soviets try to change, mid lines up, a high shot off the glass. Good check at the line by Hoggard as he steps into the Soviet player and fires it deep into the Soviet zone. There's a whistle on the play, it's offside. Finland's with that 5-3 win atop the standings. Czechoslovakia had a chance to win the gold with a victory. They failed to do so. And Canada is a point behind Czechoslovakia. Sweden, if Canada should lose, would be tied with Canada for third spot. But because Canada defeated Sweden in round robin play, Canada would automatically get the bronze at the, mo bronze at the moment. The Americans are fifth and the Soviets are in sixth place. This would be the worst performance ever in World Junior play, uh, Sherry, by a Soviet team if they lose this game. No question, and the Russians, it's been a long time since they've lost four hockey games, but they got a chance to lose here to the major power. And that coach for the Russians has got to be talking about it because Tarasov, the father of uh, Russian hockey, of course, that everybody knows about, especially in our country, has been reported, suggested, and it's been reported in the press that he thinks it's the worst job done by a coach in international hockey. And Don, when you got a guy like Tarasov making those comments, you don't want to go home too early after the tournament, I'll tell you that. Well, Vladimir Vasilyev is the Soviet coach. There's the assistant coach for the Canadian team, Pat Burns, his team back in Canada, the Hull Olympics. Bert Templeton is the head coach for the Canadian squad. Templeton was here in Czechoslovakia 10 years ago. His team lost. And Flurry cut in as he was set up. 
stopped by Sanipas, and the Soviet goaltender, Ivanikov, made the save. The best scoring opportunity of the game so far, a shot and a save by Jimmy Wake. Wake getting an opportunity to play because of a shoulder problem to Sean Simpson that was incurred in that game against Czechoslovakia, and Wade has played strongly for the Canadian team since then. Flurry bumps the Soviet player. Kostichkin in the center ice area. A lead pass is then intercepted. Just the recall for the Soviets in front, and a shot is fired wide by Zalapukas. Back at the line, the Soviets managed to keep it in. Just a Rican couldn't get a shot away as Wesley got to the puck first. Elnick dumps it out into the neutral zone. Now Zalapukin comes back for the Soviets. In the slot, a shot to save the rebound. And it's cleared off by Pat Elnick, a draft choice of the Winnipeg Jets. A long lead pass. He was looking for a lot of. It was intercepted by Smirnoff. His shot goes wide. Wesley bumped along the boards. He played very strongly in the victory, the 6-2 triumph over the United States. And now in the corner is involved in a bit of a skirmish. As a matter of fact, Wesley, who is the younger brother of Blake Wesley, drafted by Philadelphia in 1979, was chosen player of the game against the USA. He's done an outstanding job. A key man on our blue line here. I'll tell you what, the Russians, what we have to talk about, as much as we study their films, Don, they study ours. They play, they've gone to some big, strong wingers that play very aggressively and try to work the corners. Just, they've taken a lot from the Canadian game as much as we've taken from theirs. Our pictures from Piastani being provided courtesy of Czechoslovakian television. Zach Rodney waved out of the face-off circle. David Latta, draft choice of the Quebec Nordiques, into the circle now for Canada. The puck comes back to the line, and it's whistled just wide by Popoff. It ricochets off the boards all the way down the ice. On a Ankoff, tried to play it around the boards. Latta was there to keep it in. Back away and behind the net, trying to get it out front. It comes to the point. Jason with a shot. The play just goes wide. Jason can really fire that puck from the blue line. And that one was right on target. Low. And the goaltender, Ivan Goff, made the save, but a Canadian could not get a stick on on the rebound. Don, you know, uh, Ivanikov was the all-star goalie in the Four Nations Cup, but what I want to mention here is we talk about the poor record of the Russians, but they have ten players in the lineup that play in the elite division in Russia, which is equivalent to our NHL. I mean, they don't have a bunch of guys out here that just bought their skates when they came over, you know what I mean? They, they got some real good hockey players out here. Konstantinov played in the World Junior Championships last year in as a matter of fact there are five players on the Soviet team who performed in Canada last year in Hamilton. Back at the line, Shazon with a shot, it went off a leg wide and Huffman has to chase it back into his own zone. Huffman plays it around the boards. Osipov trying to keep it in, it comes back to the line. Galchenyuk unable to keep it in as it's poked to the blue line by Canada's Nemeth. Now in the center ice area, Kurt picks it up for the Soviets, stopped at the line. The Canadians gain possession. 421 has been played in this opening period. It is still scoreless. And the whistle on the play, an icing call against Canada. Now, uh, one of the things you were mentioning is this defenseman you know, uh, Konstantinov, is that the way you say it, Don? You know, I'm not a linguist, you know what I mean? Or a speech therapist. You're so good at this, I can't get over it. But you're a good shopper, Sherry. This guy, yeah, this guy is some kind of player and a big boy, six foot three. He's a definite, he, he's a, he was rated second, as a matter of fact. by the Canadians, a big ball, the puck is dumped in, they beat them to the puck, there's no question of that, just an excellent, now take a look, Canada beats them the puck, now there's the rebound, we talked about the second shot, he puts the deflection right onto the slot, before he's there, the goalie's off balance, he's on his back, he looks like a whale on the water, the puck's in the net, you cannot give Fleury a good player like that that much ice and that much net. Take a look now, the puck comes out, Canada beats the defense into the puck. The rebound out in the slot, where it's just next very much. Give me that much net, I'll get a couple more. He took the initial shot. Now, with a shot, rebound, 
question about that. We talked about this when we, most of the goals scored, scored on any hockey game or scored on the second shot. The job is you either have to clear the man or clear the puck. You give them three. Jimmy White makes a couple of big saves in there for us. It's very unfortunate because we had some momentum and the emotion and now back to, we're back to an even game. Just 11 seconds after Fleury, a product of the Moose Jaw Warriors, put Canada in front 1-0. Banging in the rebound on the initial shot by Mike Keane. The Soviets come back to tie it on the goal by Shesterikov. There's Jimmy Wade. I'll tell you, one of the mo greatest saves, one of the big time saves that we've already seen. There's, the, there's Jimmy Wade. And what a job he did on that penalty shot. That was in the game against Sweden in the final minute of play when he robbed Sandstrom on a blazing shot into the top corner. Winds up. It's deflected by Mona Enka. The Soviets come back. They're led by Zalapukin. In across the line, Zalapukin is taken off the puck by Shazon, and it's difficult, as we pointed out in our telecast the other night, to hear the whistle because of the jeering from the crowd and the whistling by the crowd. We'll return to Pia Stani after this. Sean Simpson was in goal for our telecast on Monday, that 5-1 loss to Czechoslovakia. He played very well in that setback. He could certainly not be faulted. And then he had that rotator cuff problem, Sherry, that uh, prevented him from playing. And as a result, Jimmy Waite got a chance to perform in goal, and he has starred since. They sure have. I'll tell you, both goaltenders have been outstanding. And that was significant in the 82 gold medal, down in the 85 gold medal. If it holds over today, we'll see a third one in a few years. Played in off the glass. Hoggett tried to play it off the boards and out, but it went over the glass and out of play. 1-1 is the score. We have played 534 of this opening period. Well, it's I got to tell you, what, this is what you know. This is what it's all about in international hockey. Let's be uh, you know, a gold medal game. You got three periods of hockey, 60 minutes. Ask no questions and score more goals than the other team. And this is what the excitement's all about. I've been through it, Don. You've been broadcasting a number of these games, and if you're not elected for this game, you never are. There's no question that the emotions are high, and the Canadian team was certainly revved up coming into this one. Keen in across the line with Santa Fe. Keen has bumped in against the board, carries on. Santa Pass goes into the corner as well. The two of them passing in there with a couple of Soviet players trying to get it out. Keen does. Keen circling. Still fighting in the corner. Some heavy bumping along the boards in that Soviet zone. Finally, it's Mosatov coming up with it. And he starts out for the Soviets. Great wide pass to Kurt. Kurt dumps it in and takes a hit from Fleury as the puck slides into the Canadian zone. Back comes Chazon. Chazon for Santa Fe. He took a hit from Smirnoff in the neutral zone. Good hitting by both sides. No question. That defects from stepping up and taking the body like that. They never used to do those things, Don. Osipov in the corner. Trying to control it. Canada attempting to get it out of there. Chazon passing along the boards with Osipov. Also in there is Galchenyuk. Galchenyuk at the side of the net. Here's a chance for the Soviets. And Kurt just took a backhand shot. Wade falls on top of it. And now the working hand coming following the whistle. A uh, Canadian player is down as we take a look at the replay. Now watch the, watch the goaltender, Jimmy Wade, stay with him. He comes right out to break the angle on him and said, hey, you're not getting any of this net, Mac. He walked up pretty, a little bit too easy. He, 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 we can't afford to let him walk out like that. But Jimmy Wade is tested again, and he came come through like he's done since he took over for Sean Simpson. And that should not be interpreted, as you alluded to earlier, that Sean Simpson failed. It was the injury that really took him out. The goaltending has just been outstanding. We get a shot here at Kerry Huffman, who is a first-round pick by Philadelphia. In place for the golf players who led them to the Memorial Cup last year, been one of the outstanding defensemen. Sitting beside him is Luke Richardson, who hasn't seen a great deal of action in the tournament. He basically has been the sixth defenseman as the Canadian team has gone with four and five rear guards. 
Canada bringing it out into the center ice area. Yvonne Korobo takes the hit as it slides down into the Soviet zone. Malatny is then bumped by Turgeon. Korobo comes in there as well, and they tie it up for a face-off. We're, we're watching uh, Todd Dave McElwain get up. There's an interesting story it's from Seaforth, Ontario, and I'd like to think that uh, that whole community of 2200 will be watching him because he's one of their protégés. But he was a walk-on. He was not drafted in the Ontario Hockey League. He was then traded to North Bay, and what a story he is, and what an inspiration for young people that say that thinking might be over. He was, you know, and he has been outstanding here. He centers their line. I've also noticed now, if you take a look, Corvo's boom left there in case there might be some injuries to Lada, but he switched the lines around a little bit. Back to the point, Wesley keeps it in. Lada took a shot on the leg in that victory over Sweden, and he may be having some problems, and as a result, Corvo has been moved up. In the neutral zone, Wesley gains control to Elma, get across the line, McElwain, McElwain was knocked off the puck, Corvo took a tremendous hit, lost his helmet along the boards in the process. He's a big, strong kid, though, he can take that kind of hitting. A chance for the Soviets as they steal the puck in the Canadian zone. David off, looking in front for Maligny, and it's picked off by the Canadians, they're led by Honda, Corvo still without his helmet. Hawka tried to slide it through to him, Blake breaking in on that left side. The play broken up by the Soviets. Konstantinov back into his own zone. This young man has a tremendous amount of talent. We'll be seeing a lot of him in the future in international play. He fired that shot just wide of the Canadian goal. Back at the point, the Soviets keep it in. One man back, Metcalf looking in front. Tried to slide it to Keene, and it was broken up by the Soviets and clear. 8.23 is the time elapsed in this opening period. Here comes Nilla. Nilla did slide it. Metcalf with the deflected. Shanahan gets it, and the net is knocked off its flooring. The reason for the whistle. We'll return to our coverage of the World Junior Championships from Piastani after this. 1-1 the score. Canada has been outshot so far by a 7-5. Margin is now 7-6 as that last by Shadron is right on. A lot of pushing and shoving following the whistles. There really is a lot of pushing and shoving. There's a lot of chippiness here. You know, the, the Russians, as we talked about earlier, have gone to, you know, a little more dump the puck and go after it. Not so much regrouping and a lot of figure eights that they used to go into the Bryant. The Brian Orser, uh, they're, they're not as gifted as Brian Orser either, but, and now we notice after the whistle, a lot of pushing and shoving. Chase on shot is blocked. Three Soviets dropped in front of that one. And now they move it out into the neutral zone. Zigarov shoots it into Canadian territory. Chase on is back there after it. He plays it around in the boards for Keene. He's having some problems getting out of there. Flurry comes over to help out and moves it into the neutral zone. And there's going to be a pass penalty here against Flurry of the Canadian team. That was a penalty after the, behind the play, actually. Yes, it was behind the play, and it's unfortunate. Those are the things we talked about, you know, that this team, a lot of said when we are in competition, we're going to maybe get a look at it here coming after now. The, the problem is, is that you can take the hard-working penalties. You can't take those reaction penalties, and it's tough. Because, hey, with all due respect to Flurry, he's taking a lot of heat after, too. But, you, you know, you just got to have to suck it up a few times here because they're going to try and tempt us into that kind of stuff. He got a slashing penalty, I think, didn't he, Don? Slashing call at 9.05, the first penalty of the hockey game. The Soviets with the manpower advantage. And one of the things that has stood out in the tournament has been the penalty killing of the Canadian team. Outstanding penalty. It's the old the old story. you got to get that specialty teams, your power play and your penalty killing. And if that's very effective for you, the chances are you're going to win. Galchenyuk lifts it over to Popoff. A long shot fired wide. Galchenyuk unable to control it along the boards. And Canada dumps it down the ice. Latta out there with McElwain killing off this penalty for Canada. Hoggood and Wesley on the blue line. 1-1 one, one the score. 120 remaining in the penalty to Fleury. The pass by Popov broken up by McElwain. And the Soviets have to retreat. 
to try and set up. Uh, pass cross ice, picked off by Latta. Latta takes it in deep, trying to kill off some of that time. Steve Nemeth, also out there for Canada. McElwain has gone to the bench, and these two, Nemeth and Latta, have forced the Soviets back into their own zone. Latta goes off. Elnick comes onto the ice. He and Nemeth out there now, but Elnick has gone to the bench. He took a hit there. He may have been hurt. I think he is feeling some discomfort as he goes off. The Soviets at the side of the net trying to set something up. Chesterikov in the corner. Chesterikov back to the point. Tanikov, a shot right on. And the rebound is grabbed and held by Jimmy Wake. Elnick is hurt. He took a stick there. It was a high stick across the chest of the lake. And I see that. We're now in front of the net. There's that uh, the Kotsunidov that we were talking about. He's their captain. That's what that K is for. And without question, one of the premier players. Played 66 games in the elite league in Russia already. He is, one, without question, one of their leading stars. And he's only six foot four. of course. That's all. With all that skill, I'll tell you something. He's a hockey player. 205 pounds. And every NHL scout who has been here attending the tournament drooling. They would dearly love to not only get his name on their negotiation list, but figure out some means of getting him to Canada or the United States. John, if we could bring him home as a free agent in our suitcase, we'd have 21 teams lined up. You can be sure of that. And they'd be fighting in the corners for him. 20 seconds remaining in the penalty to Fleury. Zalapukin against McElwain. The face off to the left of Jimmy Wade. McElwain has done a good job throughout the tournament in winning those faceoffs. He got another, got it back into his own zone. Shades on over Skates. Zalapukin along the boards, having problems there with Nemeth, and Nemeth fires it down the ice. What a tournament Nemeth has had. He came to the Canadian junior team from the Canadian national team, the team that won a silver medal at the Izvestia tournament in Moscow. The two sides now back at even strength with Flurry out of the penalty box. A victory by Canada by more than five goals will give Canada the gold medal. A victory will give Canada the silver. A loss when they get the bronze. A whistle on the play as the puck hits the mesh high above the glass. There's, uh, you know, Canada's playing a very good game. they got some good opportunities here. They're getting some inside chances. And if they just keep working at their game and don't worry about any of the other things, they're going to get more chances. That. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about the coach, the Russian coach, you know, and uh, there's, there's a lot more to it. If you remember, uh, he didn't let his team eat after one loss. Uh, he didn't let them have breakfast the next day, and then he wouldn't let them have, uh, after another loss, he didn't have the post-game field. The only thing I can say, Don, I hope they don't eat tomorrow. But <laughs> well, we certainly haven't had any complaints in that department. As a matter of fact, we've been eating far too much. The Czechoslovakian hospitality has been great. Outstanding. Popov, long lead pass. He was looking for Galchenyuk in the neutral zone, broken up by the Canadians and fired back in. We've remarked a couple of times about some of the chippy play, the pushing and shoving following whistles. Well, these two teams are the most penalized in the tournament. The Soviets have spent 110 minutes in the penalty box, Canada 106. And 12 of those penalty minutes by the Soviets have been incurred by the coach, Vladimir Vasiliev. And this is something very unusual to get bench minors that often. 12 minutes, very undisciplined. You can't expect the team to be disciplined if he's that undisciplined in himself. You know, if he's young, don't, don't ask him to do what he's not doing. That's my theory about it. But hey, he's got enough problems with the losses he's had without worrying about what I got to say. Chesterikov going after the loose puck. He gets it, tries to center it, knocked down by Huffman. The puck loose in that Canadian zone and finally it slides out across the blue line. Flipped in by the Soviets. Chazon is there for Canada. Long lead pass into the center ice area. Good move by Shanahan. He's up there as the puck slides into the corner. From the reaction of the crowd, I would say this is a very pro-Canadian audience here in Piazzanic. Without question. And all you have to do is spend some time with the people like you and I have, and you'll know that they're very pro-Canadian. Right in. What a good move by Kirk as he cut right in, and Jimmy Wake was equal to the occasion. Kurs skated around in that Canadian zone, 
back to the blue line and then right in and tested Jimmy Wade. He has made several good saves out of the the post. Konstantinov had snuck in from his blue line position and from the slot whistled one off the post. Kirsch has had two great chances, Don. Kirsch played the Dynamo Rego in the Elite League and uh, he's quite a hockey player. He's had two excellent chances. He's been in all alone on Jimmy Wade. An icing call against the Soviets as Wesley got back into his own zone. And again, more pushing and shoving behind the plate. And we'll return after we pause for this message. The Soviet coach, Vladimir Vasilyev, not to be confused with the outstanding Soviet player of a few years back, Valery Vasilyev. He, he, he coaches the Kimmich team in, uh, in the Elite League, by the way, and uh, I'm going to tell you something, if he gets a loss today, he can sing the Biden International Hockey, I'll tell you that, he better, he'd be happy to stay where he is, and because uh, when you've got a guy like Tarasov, who's so highly respected, literally all over the world, never mind the father of hockey in Russia, there isn't anybody that, that knows the man or has read about him that doesn't respect him, condemning him publicly, He's got some problems if, uh, if he's relying on this sport for a living, I'll tell you that. Well, that seemed to be so out of character for the Soviets for the condemnation of the coaching of Vasiliev in the Czechoslovakian press. Really, and uh, especially publicly, like you say, you know, you and I might pick up the odd word in a private conversation that's expected to be private, but uh, there's been some public condemnation, as you suggest. Penalties assessed against both sides following that icing call against the Soviets in behind the Canadian net. Wesley, two minutes for roughing. Davidoff, two minutes for roughing. That comes at 13.55 of this first period with the score tied at one. The goals just 11 seconds apart. Fleury for Canada at 4.34 and then Shestarikov for the Soviet Union. And Davidoff, Don, is a brilliant offensive player. Brilliant. Shane's on with a shot from the point. Davidoff made the save. The puck goes loose in the corner. Calvin moving into the slot. Shot close save by Avanikov. Elwick has been extremely impressive here. Extremely impressive at this tournament. And, I, and, you know, I can't say enough about him. He played for the Prince Albert Raiders. He plays for them right now. He's a first-round pick by the Jets. Take a look at him. He moves in here and drills that puck to a nice low shot and picked up by Avanikov. Well, CBC Sports has been pleased to provide coverage of the World Junior Championships, the game on Monday against Czechoslovakia, this game against the Soviet Union. Hopefully, it will be a gold medal performance by the Canadian team. Canada, with six medals in World Junior Championship play since first being introduced to the competition in 1977, two of each color. Well, there's obviously a lot lost out here, you know. They're, uh, they're trying to take a pay, they're trying to intimidate the Canadians, and you can be sure that's not going to happen, but... And conversely, the Canadians aren't going to intimidate exactly the Soviets. That's exactly right, and we can't be goofy about that, Don. You and I talked about that this afternoon in their preparation. they got to concentrate on the game. From the face-off, back to the point, Hoffman goes into the corner, takes the hit there from Konstantinov. Loose puck in the corner. Canada gets possession again. The Canadians with some aggressive forechecking. Finally, the Soviets bring it out. 14.26 has gone by in the period. Broken up by Shazon. He was looking for McElwain and Alnuk, who were trying to break in. It was broken up by Konstantinov, who got back. Ahead to McElwain. It's deflected into the Soviet zone. And it's Malakov who is back for the Soviet team. Over to his defensive partner. The two of them move it around. Konstantinov and Malakov in their own zone trying to set something up. Trying to trap the Canadians with their forechecking. But they are having some problems getting out of their own end of the rink as the teams play four on four. With players in the penalty box. Davidoff and Wesley. Lead pass broken up by Shazon. Back comes Jen Hadis. 17 year old has certainly played well in this tournament and his stock as a draft choice has certainly risen on the basis of his play. 
Smirnoff attempted to split the defense. Broken up. Canada comes back. Orlando too far. Individual play by that young man. Great individual play. The Russians came up. He got four checks of pressure a little bit. Make no mistake about it. That is a great individual. Watch it. That's pursuit of the puck. Absolute strong pursuit. Skates on him. Four checks him. Save the night right along the ice. Hey, if you do that in hockey schools and you draw those on blackboards, that's David Lionel. What a great play on his part. And he certainly shows his work why he was drafted by the Quebec Nordiques, as we know already. And a first round pick. Plays for the Kitchener Rangers. And you know, hey, what can you say? That's the kind of individual effort. That's what you look for in championship play. And now the Canadians are looking at a 2 1 lead. The fifth goal of the tournament for David Lana. An unassisted tally at 15 32. Canada leads by a score of 2 1. Canada will win the goal if they can score a got the first goal of the game. If Canada should win by four, they would be tied with Finland, and then they would have to haul up the computers to determine where the gold medal would go. So Canada can assure itself of the gold medal with a five-goal victory. They're four away from that objective right now. In across the line, Chesterikov with a shot that's deflected to the corner. Maligny, one of the 17-year-olds on the Soviet team, takes the bump in the corner over to the other side. It's Joseph, he too, just 17 years of age, one of the youngest players in the tournament, as a matter of fact. He won't reach his 18th birthday until the 10th of September. Phenomenal play. All good. Back to the net, trying to slide it out front. And the Soviet goaltender got a stick there just in time. Popoff makes the shot, goes into the slot, lets the shot go, Jimmy waits to say. Hoffman plays it up along the board, Shanahan moving it out slowly for the Canadian team. He was looking for Shazon, it was knocked away from him. 16.59 as the time gone by in this opening period, 2-1, Canada leading. The go-ahead goal by Dave Latta. In across the line, Canada has it. Shot by Seneca, rebound! They back away out of it, still loose. And it's taken back to the net by Tom Ditka. Long lead pass. Broken up in the centerized area. It appeared as though there was a whistle. Some of the players thought there was a whistle as well. But it was the jeering of the crowd. As I've said a couple of times, it's very difficult when these fans here start to whistle and jeer to hear those whistles down on the ice. Malatov. The Zalapuka. Zalapuka starts it in. Nice save right along the ice by Jimmy Wade. He looked back to see if it went in because he couldn't feel the puck. I guess that's a goaltender's first reaction is take a look and see if the light's on. But we'll get a good look at this when he breaks in the middle. He's in there all alone with the back end right along the ice. Nice save. Does the butterfly. The puck's underneath you, Jimmy. Thanks very much, everybody. Says it. It's still 2-1 Canada. 14-12. The Soviets so far have outshot the Canadian team. But Canada is in front by a score of 2-1. Jimmy Wade has made some tremendous saves, not only in this game, but throughout the tournament. There's another uh, glove save on that shot from the top of the circle. And we'll be showing you highlights of the game against the United States and against Sweden during the intermission. And you'll be able to judge for yourself just how brilliant this 17-year-old goaltender was making that glove save on the penalty shot by Sandstrom of Sweden to preserve a 4-3 win. I guess the Rangers didn't see that game against Sweden. They keep trying to test his glove down. But uh, this kid hasn't been drafted either. Of course, this is, a, this is a gold mine this year for this Canadian team for the Scouts. 1.57, the time left to play in this first period. 2-1, Canada in front. Hoggett is bumped in against the end board by Kirsch, manages to poke it free, and Canada breaks out. Trying to go to the outside of the Soviet defenseman Popov. Comes back to the point. Harvard winds up the shot and stops. And Wade comes way out of his net into the circle to make the play and clear it out of the zone. 
The Soviets wait until the player gets on side. Better to reach off and just play long enough. That's a, 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 great, a great example is that Kirsch took a dive. He went down looking for a penalty call there, took a dive, and he cost his own team the chance to come in alone and get a good scoring chance because it took them that much longer to get out of the offensive zone. So sometimes it can't hurt you. Hey. Most of the benches are very close here down there. Straight, well, as a matter of fact, you can't get any closer unless you're at each other's bench. And with the feeling and the emotion that's going on, and the Russian coach being a little bit of a referee baiter, and then the Canadian team well into it emotionally, uh, we can see some heat over there today. I wouldn't be surprised if Pat Burns, the assistant coach for Canada, is doing a little baiting himself. Uh, the Soviet coach, Vasiliev, fired into the Soviet zone. With Cup. And the only thing they changed, that's, you know, that's beating Czechoslovakia, Finland, and uh, Sweden and with the same basic team. And the only thing they changed from that since last September is their defense. I think they'll be changing it again. Well, I think the Finns might be a little nervous right about now because after their 5-3 victory over Czechoslovakia, they may have felt that the gold medal was assured because with Canada facing the Soviets, Canada was forced to win by five. Not really an ideal situation for the Canadian team, but Canada now leads by a score of 3-1. And if they should win by four, the two teams would be tied in goals for and against the goal differential. And then it would require a rather complicated formula, as I said, to determine which side gets the gold medal. Zalapukin in the corner, looking back. Kalman coming in on the right side. He tried to go around the Soviet defenseman, and Popov made a nice move to get back. The Soviets starting out on the left side. Yes, off a shot right on, kicked into the corner by Waite. Augut takes it in against the boards, trying to hold it there, and does for a faceoff. You know, there's, uh, we're, we're getting a look at Flurry right now on the bench and uh, waiting to go on. That uh, he has been outstanding with his quickness, and uh, which is really an advantage with this in international play with the long passes, which is somewhat especially this big ice surface time. And uh, Brad Walker, Walker is going to talk to him, I guess, uh, that during the intermission, I understand. Yes, Fred Walker of CBC Radio, who is working with us on the telecasts, will talk to him during the intermission. And back in the studio, Brian Williams and Don Carey are standing by. You think Grape likes this uh, performance by the Canadian team? Uh, I'll tell you what, you can be sure. Grape likes that kind of hockey in the corners, work the front of the nets and work the corners. That's Grape's game, and uh, I'm sure he's excited right back there in, this, in the studio right now. I'm sure he'll be saying, give me a guy like that, Flurry, 5'10", 160 pounds, physically aggressive, bumping people. And indeed, the young man who plays for the Moose Jaw Warriors has been, and he scored two goals so far tonight. You know, that Hoffman kid who's only 5'10 on the blue line has been outstanding. We've seen some big guys in trying to knock him around, and he, all, he always takes the hit to make the play, and I'm sure Don will talk about that. That's so important when you're, when you got a young kid. But you get the big heart, you're willing to take that hit, that's the toughness that you look for. Just 11 seconds remaining in the period. 
3-1 Canada in front. Dump down the ice by the Canadian team. This will produce another icing call with just three seconds remaining in this first period. That Canadian bench has to be pumped up with their performance during the first 20 minutes. They have moved into that 3-1 lead thanks to a two-goal performance by Theron Fleury and an unassisted tally by Dave Latta. The face-off back in the Canadian zone to the left of Jimmy Waits. I guess the people in Russell, Manitoba, where Theron Fleury's from, uh, will be just as fired up as those people in Seaforth, Ontario. But I'd be surprised if the whole country wasn't that excited right now. Well, wherever you're looking in this afternoon, we hope you're enjoying the action, and this could very well be a gold medal performance by the Canadian team. The first time Canada won a gold medal was in 1982. Jerry Basson was the manager of that team, and then in Helsinki, Finland in 1985. From the face off, the shot blocked, and there's the horn ending the period. Medvedev took a shot that was blocked by one of the Canadian players after the whistle, but again, it's very difficult to hear the whistle. So after one period, it's 3-1. The Canadian team leading the Soviet Union. Theron Fleury with a two-goal performance, another by Dave Latta. Shesterikov has scored for the Soviet Union. We have an interesting intermission coming up for you. We invite you to stay with us. We'll be back after this. A full house at Zimini Stadium in Piastani watching the action. And as you look in on the CBC network this Sunday afternoon, we hope you're enjoying this Canadian try for a gold medal as these 1986-87 World Championships conclude. Czechoslovakian television providing us with the pictures from Pia Stani. And Jimmy Waite, the 17-year-old goaltender, has performed brilliantly. He let in one goal in that first period, but the Soviets had three swipes at it before they finally nudged it past him. Shesterikta credited with the goal. A jam-packed group of people here to watch it. Don't make no mistake whose side they're on it, Don. I think you alluded to that, that, uh, that every time we score, I think they want to see a couple more. And well, earlier, Czechoslovakia had a chance to win the gold, to clinch the gold, as they faced Finland. Had Czechoslovakia won, the gold medal would have stayed right here. However, Finland won. They defeated Czechoslovakia 5-3. That sets the stage for this gold medal battle, Canada against the Soviet Union. The Soviets don't have a chance for the gold medal, for a medal of any color, as a matter of fact. But Canada, if it can win this game by five goals, will clinch the gold medal. If they win by four, they will be tied with Finland for points. Because the two teams in round robin play tied at six, then they go into goals four and against the quotient system to determine which side gets the goal. They'll get out the calculators. It's important not only how many goals you score, but how many you give up. We have skiing coming on Sports Weekend, coming your way later on this afternoon from Switzerland. But right at the moment, we're ready to drop the puck for the start of the second period in Piastani, Czechoslovakia. The Canadian team after the gold medal. The puck in across the Canadian line. And it's a delayed offside called against the Soviets. Apparently those scores in the earlier games were Finland 5, Czech 3, I guess. Sweden 8, USA nothing, which is really a surprise because that was a medal game. And Poland 8, Switzerland 3. So Poland stays in the A group and Switzerland goes back to the B group. There'll be joy in Poland tonight. What is interesting about that uh, Swedish victory is that all four Swedish wins in the tournaments were by shutouts. That's a, that's a great trivia quiz. Canada, taking the shot to Elnick. It's underneath. Ivanikov, as Elnick was unable to jam it past him on the setup from Lada. Lada faked the shot, slid it across, and Ivanikov made the save. Elnick did a good job of just controlling the puck. You notice the pass in his skate. He brings it up to his stick. 
which was a nice shot, but it would just happen to be the pass a little bit into his feet and behind him. He does a great job. The youngster from Foam Lake, Saskatchewan. I know the town well. I know the town well. Give him credit representing our country. There's Bert Templeton who's in this tournament with five of his players, by the way, that uh, from North Bay that are playing for USA, Canada, and in coaching the Canadian team. Probably explains to some extent why those emotions were running so high in that game between Canada and the United States. One versus the other. Matter of fact, was one of his players thrown out. From the face off, Chester Rikoff tries to bring it out. It's deflected by Shanahan up into the crowd and out of play. You may notice that the Canadian team is wearing black armbands, and that's in memory of the players with the Swift Current Broncos who were killed in that tragic bus accident on New Year's Eve. An absolute tragedy, uh, a tragedy beyond description. Don, I know the world is full of tragedies, but those of us involved with this sport and the vibrant young men that play it find this tragedy most difficult to accept. And so to the families, Don, from those of us and yourself and myself, and those of us in the sport, and especially in the Canadian Major Junior Hockey League, I want to express our deepest and most sincere sympathy. Definitely coming up. And the Canadian squad will have a manpower advantage for the first time in the game. Galchenyuk going off. The slashing call. No, make that. Malikoff going off to the penalty box. Malikoff who uh, plays for the Moscow Spartak. And there's the world championship puck that somebody has got a souvenir for. And you won't get it from him either, I'll tell you that. No matter what you want to get. Now, we're going to get a look at the specialty team from the other side. Now, we're going to look at the power play and their man advantage. They've done such an outstanding job shorthanded. Now, they got a chance to really take a commanding lead here. And right now, when we talked about the Swift Current Bronco car accident, they are observing a moment of silence here in the Piastani Stadium. Great pass by Wesley and the save by Ivanikov. 
as Wesley started up from his own end and went right around the Soviet defenders at the Russian blue line. We've watched that young man, Glenn Wesley. We're zeroing in on him. Thanks for our cameraman and our director. There he is going to the bench. He's had some great individual efforts. The boy from Portland Winterhawks, he's not been drafted. And we talked about all the Russians are drooling over. Just a minute. This guy here, there we got him right there again on the bench. He has had an outstanding tournament. The stock, as we mentioned, of a number of these young players has certainly risen on the basis of their performance in this tournament. Without question. Conversely, Pierre Turgeon came into this tournament tough as probably a sense to be the number one draft choice right now in the eyes of many of the scouts might no longer be number one. Without no question, I can use that word without question, but he's not had a good tournament. I think if you ask him about it, he'll tell you that himself. Well, Turgeon is out there right now along with Stefan Watt and Brendan Shanahan. Figueroa to Figueroa as the Soviets almost set something up while they were shorthanded. Fedorov is the youngest player in the tournament. He just turned 17. He's number nine for the Soviets on December the 13th. Loose puck in the center ice area. Fired in on the right side for Nemeth. Nemeth puts on the brakes, trying to set it up. Oh, the slot. Oh, hit the Nemeth again, shot right on. The rebound as they try and pick it out. Nemeth gets it back to the point. And Huffman couldn't keep it in. The Soviets back in full strength. And there's a whistle on the play. A penalty coming up here. There's Sylvain Turgeon. We got him right there. It's a penalty coming to the Russians again for a dump play. Turgeon was put out there right now for Bert with that power play to use his great offensive skill. And as a matter of fact, created some opportunities because he is a brilliant offensive player. And the guy that's touted number two before the number 18 just on the bench there too. The cameraman got a shot at both of them. Those guys were the two reported guys, one and two in the country, Don. Popov drawing the penalty for slashing at 3.02. So Canada will enjoy another power play. They came so close on their previous opportunity. They lead by a score of 3-1. Play broken up in the center ice area. Fired back into the Canadian zone. Hoggood retreats after it. Hoggood, a native of St. Albert, Alberta. He plays for Kamloops of the Western Junior League and was drafted in the 10th round by Boston. Very pass, intercepted by Canada. Get in. Alnook. Back to the point for Hawkins. And then the Soviets break it up and deflect it out to the center ice area. Hawkins trying to set things up for Team Canada. He shoots it in. 106 remaining in the penalty. Soviets unable to clear. Joseph keeps it in at the point. Back to the line. Joseph takes the shot and deflects right in the goal mouth. And Ivanikov managed to keep that one out. Canada pressuring the Soviets. Here the Hoggett at the other point. Playing it back at the net. Out front for Lada. He had to go back at the goal. They try and center it. And McElwain gets it to the point. Hoggett sliding it in for McElwain. He has difficulty controlling it. He's taken in against the board by Konstantinov. And they hold it for a faceoff. Hey. The big thing you want is the good opportunities, the real good opportunities. There's Hoggett who's got, got to keep some key goals and a good offensive player. But the what we got to talk about this this specialty team in the power play is to get the good chances. If you get if you don't get the good chances, sure the puck didn't go in the net. One of the two power plays, they've had three or four good scoring chances, Don. That's all you can ask for. Well, Canada jumped into the 3-1 first period lead, and Burton Templeton's squad has had a lot of jump in this second period as well. Dominated the play without no question about dominating the play so far. Turgeon is out there now. Shanahan is there on the wing along with Stefan Waugh. Back to the goal for Turgeon. Turgeon 
to Juan, the other corner, had difficulty controlling it, gets it back to Turgeon, to the point, he was looking for Chazon, it slid past him all the way down the ice, and that will run out the power play. So, two penalties against the Soviets to start the second period, but Canada unable to add to its 3-1 advantage. And the face the shot, right there, and Turgeon was standing right there, couldn't deflect it. In front for Nevis, he couldn't get a shot away, Turgeon pulls the trade. A shot bounces off a leg, off the stick of Shanahan. Turgeon gets it again. Turgeon in the corner, having trouble there with Sigurov. They tie it up for a face-off. And Pierre Turgeon is brilliant offensively. He's got great sight, great vision. Literally knows where everybody is on the ice when he's got it. It's not only his, you know, not only his skill and the way he handles the puck, he certainly knows where everyone is. And he, he's, he's more than just a credible hockey player, and you can see why he got those ratings. Well, he too is just 17 years of age. He won't celebrate his 18th birthday until August, but he is eligible, of course, for the 1987 amateur draft. He plays for Granby. He hasn't had a lot of ice time here at the World Junior Championships, but there is no doubt he does possess some skill. On the shot is blocked. Two on one break. Brilliant. Zabapukin coming in. Went a good job of getting back to knock it away from him. Dump down the ice, a race for the loose puck. Picked up by Santa Pass, and it's called an offside pass by Canada. We'll return right after this. Play just underway. Wesley keeps it in the Soviet zone. Picked up in the corner by Kostichkin. He takes a hit from Fleury. Flurry may only be 5'10 and 160 pounds, but he certainly throws his weight around, and now he and Monica are pushing and shoving. And then Santa Pass gets involved with Papa. And there are a number of minor, minor brush fires that flare up, and they're quickly extinguished, although Flurry is still involved over there with Monica. There's some emotion going on, you know. I think that Cooler Head's got to be failed because now there's just been some penalties called and so forth and uh, it's, we can't afford foolish things. We got, we got good control of this game so far now and go in and make the hits and play the tough hockey it's required but it's no time now to deal. There's got to be some good mental preparation. It's not how well you prepare strategically on the ice. You got to prepare yourself emotionally and strategically off the ice too. Penalties are going to be assessed against both teams. And I recall when Terry Simpson coached the Canadian team to a gold medal in 1985, and you were the general manager, one thing the two of you stressed was action penalties, but not reaction penalties. I feel very strong about that. If they're good, they're good hard-working penalties, you can kill those off. It's the reaction stuff that gets you in trouble. We have a slight delay here, so while we take a look, we'll be back right after this message. Still standing at that Canadian bench, penalties are going to be assessed, but so far there has been no indication as to who they are against or what they are for. I know that the, the Russian team has taken some exception to it. Remember that they got a delay a game penalty called on them when we were watching them previously in the tournament, and uh, I guess it's a question of proper communication here and getting it clarified. Hans Roning of Norway is the referee. And he's been letting them go. Uh, he's letting them get away with quite a bit in this game. One of the things they're talking about, uh, we got a shot right off the Canadian bench. Of course, the, the curvature of their blade is within regulation. A lot of the European teams, you get a look at a lot of the European teams and the curvature, it looks like a banana. And uh, it, it, compared to our blades, because we fall within the particular legislation. Now, if also considered I'm gentlemanly gone if you call if, if, you, if you call that curb stick, say you're not supposed to do it, but hey, a, a rule is a rule as far as we're concerned. I know Simpson, you uh, called up uh, Latin in, when we were involved in the tournament two years ago, and they were very upset about it, but the fact remains is, if there's a rule call. Well, double minors have been assessed against both teams, Flurry and Sandy Pass are off for Canada, Popov and Mona Inkoff for the Soviet Union. 
Well, that uh, bothers me a little bit because I don't like the Russians to have all that ice surface and uh, only three people. We're a little used to the NHL rule, you know what I mean here. It's a little different situation in international hockey. Normally when we'd see something like that, we'd see five against five. Is that a choir here that's uh, going to serenade us or is that one of the hockey teams, John? Well, I think in all likelihood that is one of the hockey teams because the closing ceremonies for the tournament will take place here at the Zimini Stadium in Piastani. And the teams that played earlier had sufficient travel time to move from Topolchani, Trenchant, or Nitra to Piastani for the windup. So they're playing three skaters against three. by the Canadian player Wesley. Now Canada starts up. Wesley goes cross ice to Hagen. Also out there is McElwain. Hagen moved in across the line, but McElwain was ahead of the play. The you take a look at that time, it's a little hard to figure, but it isn't. The time is counted up here, and the penalty minutes are counted down. So I'm glad you're calling the play-by-play -play down, because I'd have it all mixed up, and I wouldn't know if there's a minute and 26 left in the period, and 6.36 in the penalty, or what goes on. But when it comes to discovering crystal shops, you are the leader among all visitors to Czechoslovakia. <laughs> Three skaters against three. Canada leading by a score of 3-1. David Roth with a couple of good moves. Back in the net. Looking out front. Safe. The way that he was allowed to come from behind the net and try to jam it in. Now the Canadian team having some problems in this three against three situation. Yeah, too much ice surface, and they, those three players on the ice, Ossipop and David Off, are highly skilled, world-class players, and uh, you don't want to give them some ice time. Nemo takes the back of the net. There's going to be a penalty here. David Again, Off, I think David Off is going to get some slashing. A little sarcastic by the Canadian players waving goodbye to them. I want to talk a little bit, if i got a second here, on this David Off. He's a world-class player. And you notice when he come around and tried to poke it, he is quick. Don, this guy runs the half minute in 22 seconds. The half mile. No, the half minute in 22 <laughs> seconds. Runs the half minute in 22 seconds. That's quick, isn't it? I mean, when you can do that, that's quick. Take, we just got a shot at that. He, when you give him that ice time and that ice surface, he's going to do something with it. Hey, they need one more for bridge in the penalty box <laughs> on the Russian bench. Canada leading by a score of 3-1. We're at the 7.25 mark of this second period. All the scoring so far in the first period. Uh, there's Vassal up now taking a look here and expressing some disgust, I guess. We won't uh, see the shorthanded here uh, for some time here. How does that clock work again, Doc? <laughs> well, the period time comes up to 20 minutes. The penalty minutes count down from two minutes. And, of course, in European ranks, when they do whistle and jeer, they are not pleased with what is... Three skaters against three, and then Canada will get the man advantage. Back at the line, Smirnoff keeps it in for the Soviets. Knocked down by Canada, now they break up. Two on one, a pass over on the right side. Huffman going in, slides it over, and it bounces over the stick of McElwain. Smirnoff behind his own goal on these big European ice surfaces. A lot of room. Canada out of the penalty box. Flurry tried to step around. Smirnoff knocked away from him. Canada now enjoying a man advantage for a minute and 50 seconds. Mona Ankoff loses it at the line and Shazon starts back for Canada. Lead pass off the stick of Lana. He was unable to control it. Lada has scored the other Canadian goal, an unassisted tally in the first period. Back at the Soviet net, they tie it up for a face-off. The whistle, very quick in this international junior tournament. Very, very quick whistle, and, and uh, we talked about it in our previous telecast. Uh, you know, I guess they're trying to avoid injury, and uh, there'd be a lot of delay games if we were watching an NHL game right now. 
Jimmy White there cleaning his crease, very cool, very calm. He hasn't had a lot of work this period, but he was true to the test there by David Ott just earlier. There was Fleury who had scored two goals for the Canadian team. 132 remaining in the man advantage. Well, not sure, not sure, buddy, not Canada sure. has to begin cashing in on these power plays. They had two earlier in the period. In an, an emotional change if they don't, because the Russians will feel that they can't take those penalties. Back at the line. Wesley slides it into Alnick. Alnick trying to get it back to the point to Wesley. He does. Now it's McElwain trying to bang it off the boards looking for Latta, but it's intercepted by the Soviets and they play it down the ice. 110 remaining in the penalty. Canada to the attack. On the right side for McElwain. He had to stop and put on the brakes and the Canadians regroup in the neutral zone. Hoggett having some problems, loses it to Chesterita. Quick shot just wide. There's another whistle and a penalty call now coming up against Canada. There's a, a penalty after the play, too, behind the play. There's the equipment manager, Wally, and there he is with that pancake cutter. He's not cooking pancakes now, boy, but he's as hot as a pancake. You can be sure of that. That was quite a scene that the camera people caught when they were having that. How come we didn't get any of that? That's what I want to know. As a matter of fact, you don't need any. You don't need any of those pancakes, Don. I don't want you eating any of that. Your wife sees you, she won't recognize you anyway. Well, we'll see. Wally Tatamer directing the chefs in the kitchen of the Canadian team's hotel at breakfast yesterday morning during our second intermission. So, 152 in the Canadian penalty, 42 seconds remaining in the Soviet penalty. Damn it. In the corner. Doing a good job of controlling it. Back to the line. Bounces away from Huffman. And all the way back into the Canadian zone. Hoggood with a two-minute penalty for holding coming at 9.15. The pass too far for Nevin. Prevent a fourth Canadian goal. We've seen a couple of big glove saves here. Now take a look at, you know, Shanahan can snipe too, boy. He's a player. He knows. He looks at that spot. He's got to look up there. And it's it's labeled too. Big time save. We've seen both goaltenders make big time glove saves. And I'll tell you what. It, you know, Brendan's talking to himself a little bit right now, but gives some credit to Ivanikov. He made a big save. That was a game turner, maybe, too, Don. You know, that, uh, that's a crucial save and at the same time a crucial goal for the Canucks. We're approaching the midpoint of the second period. In just 10 seconds, the Soviets will have a power play. A shot from the point goes wide. Osipov in his own zone. He goes rink wide to Malakoff. The Soviets now at full strength. Pass intercepted by Latta and he dumps it back into the Soviet zone. Osipov tries it again to Kirk. Kirk with a drop pass, shot off the crossbar. That deflects high and out of play. Well, that's uh, the old crossbar in the goalpost, the goalie's best friend when you're playing this game, and there's just no question about that. But in the meantime, it was deflected off his glove. He got his glove on it first, and that's when it's important. The, uh, I, I, don't, I can't ever recall for all the time I've been involved in international hockey and, and uh, world championship hockey to see a Russian team make so many defensive mistakes, Don. I know you've called a lot of games. I doubt you've seen it at all either. We certainly aren't used to seeing sloppy play inside the Soviet zone. That's the best description. Konstantinov back to his own line. Lead pass for Kurz. Kurz trying to drop it again to the point. Malikov manages to keep it in, but the Canadians succeed in driving it out, although it was deflected over the boards and out of play, actually into the Canadian bench. And at the Canadian bench, that's the team doctor, Mark Aubrey from Ottawa. He's been fairly busy, you know, maybe some money. 
I guess from a medical standpoint, you might suggest that there are minor injuries, but they're not minor when you're running a hockey team right, coach and you want those guys back out on the ice. This Canadian team, by the way, will be uh, leaving after the uh, victory dinner tonight. The wind up to the tournament by bus for Vienna. And then they will be taking an early morning play back to Canada. And now he's pushing at, jumping at. Nikolov comes charging in. Hoffman is there for Canada along with McElwain. Go oh boy, Chase. That's it, that's it. I was just doing a scouting report on Davidoff when we were talking about it just today, and they said he holds his temper real well. <laughs> I don't know who wrote that report, but uh, he's a fiery, he's a fiery kid, that guy. Maybe the same individual who wrote the report in 1972 that Tretiak was the weak spot in Soviet gold. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think. You were talking about this young Canadian team, apparently. And I think it's a statistic that you came up with, which is... But that's what makes you so good at what you do, that you find these little things. I think there's 11 Canadian players, didn't you say, are eligible to return for the next championship, which is a year away. And I think that's, uh, I think that's pretty authentic, too. So this is a fairly young team. And when you talk about 17-year-olds, that's a history lesson for you. I'm surprised you can think back that far, Don. <laughs> well, there are double minors. Davidoff of the Soviets, Lada of Canada for roughing. That comes at 10.51. Jesterikov leaves it there for Smirnoff. Canada leading by a score of 3-1. A Canadian victory by five goals will assure Canada of the gold medal. Jesterikov back in the net. As we have pointed out many times, lots of room behind the goal. Cigarette score! A screenshot by Cigarette as he got the puck back in the point. It's three two. Almost every coach will tell you, when you get the puck from the point, shoot it low. It's hard for the goalie to pick it up. You're there for the rebounds or the deflections. Low shot right between his legs. He had a tough time picking it up. There's a lot of action in front of him. Now they get control of the puck behind the net. Take a look here. You can see it very clearly. Right back to the point. He sets it up. Now take a look at the action in front of Jimmy Wake. He's got to get that guy out of the way. It's a low shot. Hey, that's Jimmy Wake's fault. I mean, that's you get. That's exactly what you teach the defenseman to do, where to shoot the puck, and it's tough for a goalie to play. I think Kostitskin may have deflected that shot. Now, Chesterikov and Kostitskin come in again. The puck loose in that Canadian zone. Finally, Canada gains possession, and they start back. Sigurov stops the Canadian player, Elnuk, with a body check in the center ice area. 11.34 is the time gone by in the second period. 3-2, Canada leading the Soviets. Dumped into the corner to Nemeth. Nemeth goes cross ice for Chason. Chason was knocked down, couldn't control it. Konstantinov to Kostichkin. Pass bounces off the leg, and the Soviets move back into their own zone. something on that one as he whistled it high just under the crossbar as you said reminiscent of the goal he scored in the victory the 6-2 triumph over the united states just you know, we go right back to what you said there's no better description just sloppy play by the russians don't say anything else the fifth goal of the tournament for nemeth in the neutral zone zalapukin 
Fires it over on the right side. Polygny trying to get a shot away. He was tied up. And the puck brought out to the line and deflected over the glass and out of play. There'll be a lot of ice packs, I'll tell you, on that bus. First of all, those kids won't get any sleep because they're going directly back. And I know you and I had a touch of the flu today, and I know what that would do if we had to be up all night like they're going to be. And But there'll be a lot of ice packs strapped to their bodies. And I'll tell you something. If they got the gold medal around their neck, they won't even feel the bruises. You can be sure of that. Well, Steve Nemeth will be heading home already with a silver medal from the Isvastia tournament. He has not been home since the Isvastia tournament as he came directly to Czechoslovakia to join the Canadian junior team. So he would love to head back with both the gold and the silver. From the face-off, a shot right on. Waite makes the save as Hoggard and Osipov do some shoving in front of the net. You know, was, we were talking about Nemeth from the Olympic team, and it's nice to see he's a delightful young man that we got to meet. You know, never complains, just goes out there and works so hard. It's been such a key. You know, we, we've talked about the other players. There's the Zolatsky that's on that Olympic team that, that was eligible to play here. There's the goaltender Birkin, as it happened. Now, Jimmy Waite's come up big, but they had a goaltender hurt in Simpson. And, you know, it's the old protecting empires, you know what I mean? And it's the same thing in the NHL. Everybody protects their own empire. The difference is that when you see this Russian team, they got their best here. The European team, they got 10 elite players, the best players they could possibly get under 20 years old playing. And the simple fact is, this isn't an excuse. Canada doesn't. There are many uh, who would have dearly loved to have seen Zalapsky in particular playing in this tournament. He was voted the best player in the Investia tournament, and that's quite an accomplishment. Here's Canada in across the line again. Nemeth with a shot, and it's blocked. Konstantinov dropped in front of that one. The two penalized players, Lana and Davidoff, out of the penalty box. Oh, what a hit there! As Konstantinov was sent flying, Hoggut stepped into him. He had his head down, and Hoggut really caught him. Now the Soviets to the attack again. Davidoff, drop pass. Ossipov, drop save by Jimmy Wade as he got a piece of it. The Canadians clear the zone. Konstantinov has to wait for his teammates to get back on side before feathering that pass over to Davidoff, who is forced back into his own zone. Into the neutral zone now. Zalapukin, net across the line, trying to go around Joseph. The puck goes back to the net. Jason plays it around on the boards and out, dumped back in offside by the Soviets. We'll return to our live coverage from Piazdani right after we pause for this message. Well, we had a real skirmish just moments ago following a face-off. It all started when
has gone off to the dressing room. The players trying to sort out their equipment. But something like this has just never happened in international hockey. So the other night in the game between Canada and the U.S., when the Canadian player Shazon was ejected along with Hartman of the U.S. team, they were suspended for one game. Now the players are going off the ice. The players are leaving the ice. Fred Walker is down at the Canadian bench. Fred, what's happening? Have a Sandy pass. You were the first one involved in that break. It's on the other side of the ice. What happened? Uh, I guess it was just a bit too aggressive there. Um, uh, well, they mean at us all through the game, and uh, you know, I don't think we took. I think we took a bit too much, and I think I I, I was going to settle it down a bit. I wasn't expecting for the other guys to do it, but uh, I didn't really expect that at all. The Soviet responded, though. Yes, yeah, they did. Um, it's just. Uh, I just thought maybe uh, the guys would get more confidence on them because they were sticking us and everything. I was just trying to, you know, settle them down a bit. Well, now you have to go to the dressing room. We're going to try and see whether we can find out from something from the coaches later. But uh, when when the, the whole thing erupted over there, it was just you and the Soviet player. What got the others started? I don't really know. I was just paying close attention to the guy that I was with. Um, I really don't know how it all started. I mean, all the other ones started. Okay, they're looking for you now back at the dressing room because everybody's heading back there for a brief uh, rest and I guess they're talking to them, the coaching staff. Calm down, there's still a period and a half remaining in this game. Okay, okay. Yeah. Everett, Everett Sandy Pass. Now let's go back upstairs to Don and Sherry. Well, there are six minutes and seven seconds remaining in the second period. And I understand, Sherry, that the time will be added to the third period. But this is something that we have just never seen in international hockey. Oh, we certainly have never seen it. I think what they, you know, that's what we anticipate they'll do. Is the odd time that it is broken out in our hockey games in Canada, and, and, and it really is, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it makes every newspaper. You can be sure this is. I would expect that's what they'll do. They'll flood the ice. They'll bring them in, they'll talk to the captains, they'll talk to the coaches, and they'll say, hey, okay, you guys, settle this thing down. That's an incident we're not proud of. Let's get it over with. The interesting point that you make, though, is how are they going to deal with those that were involved in the fight? That's the issue. Well, almost every player on the ice had paired off and was trading punches with another player. So it wasn't just one or two that were involved in the actual fighting. Every player on the ice was throwing punches, and there were some great punch-ups, believe me, taking place out there. But the officials left the ice. They went off to the dressing rooms. So I don't know how they're going to deal with this because the international rules call for automatic ejection for fighting. I think that, you know, there's no question about that. It seems to me that if the game's going to go on, what they're going to have to go to are the, the people that initiated the whole skirmish. And they're going to have to identify who left the bench early, which is exactly what we do. Identify those people as the aggressors, as the people. They may not only just get a penalty done, they may get thrown right out of the game. And therefore, we're going to see few less players, obviously, to rely on. And they could be some key players for Canada. But that's what I anticipate. And the Russian was the first player to leave. I'm not trying to sound like a homer when I saw it. He was ahead of him by 10 or 15 feet. Of course, when we, in, in, where we play the game, if somebody leaves the bench, we're not about to be out man. And as a matter of fact, Huffman was getting walked there by two guys as it happened, but everybody could see there was just so much action. And I mean, they were throwing them. I mean, this wasn't just dance with me, Henry. They were swinging, I'll tell you. But it isn't going to do much for Canada's international hockey image. The pregame brawl with the United States the other night. Now, this incident with the Soviet Union, there will be headlines, I'm sure, in tomorrow's newspapers throughout Europe. Oh, you can be sure of that because we were a party involved in both actions. And, of course, and of course if you haven't seen it, and you know how the rumor goes, and I say to you, and that Mr. and Mrs. They say, everybody says, that, well, who said it? Well, that's what they say. And pretty soon before you know it, and you can be sure we're going to be noted as the aggressors. The fact is it happens. Now we got to clean it up and get on with the game because that's what we're here to watch. Well, this facility is still a buzz because the spectators in Czechoslovakia have just never seen anything like this in international hockey. Well, I'll tell you, if you want a real example of it,
it. I looked at you because I didn't know how to react. And you looked at me, we said, I couldn't believe it. And that's that's just how, that's how amazed we were. You can imagine how the fans here were. Well, a lot of times you will see pushing and shoving, a lot of stick work, some kicking in European hockey, but nothing like we just witnessed here at the stadium in Peter Stanley. Right now, let's try and find out a little more. Let's get down to Fred Walker. Well, Don, we have Wally Tatimer, the trainer of the team here, and he was near the Soviet bench when all this broke out, but he also, I think, saw some of the Soviets being sent over the bench to go and get into that brawl, did you, Wally? Yeah, they sent two guys right off the bench right away when the uh, the altercation broke out there, and uh, the coach sent two guys right off the bench. It's unbelievable. It's been a rough enough game uh, as it is, uh, you know, for the first and second period, and... Uh, I just can't believe him sending two uh, two guys off the bench uh, to get into that altercation. That's why everything just broke loose. Well, you know, the Soviet coach is, has a reputation for being a little volatile at times. Maybe he's showing it out there. Well, I, uh, you know, maybe that's his uh, way of uh, testing us. But, like, uh, we can play that type of rough game, but we don't, you know, we don't want to play that. we just rather go out and play an aggressive hockey game, but uh, it's just getting out of hand. Okay, Wally, you're on your way to the dressing room. Uh, we'll keep in touch and find out what does happen to you. Right now, let's go from Piestani back home to Canada where Brian Williams and Don Cherry are standing by. All right, thank you, Fred Walker. I agree with Sherry Basson, a black mark for international hockey. There should be headlines over this incident. Don Cherry, it's the first time uh, Don and Sherry talked about it. They were surprised. We looked at each other here in the studio. I couldn't believe the Russians were fighting back. Oh, I like that. That was good. Uh, I'm surprised that it really hasn't happened before in international hockey. Uh, the kids said it after. A lot of people don't realize. If you saw during the fight, there was a lot of kicking going on. The one thing we don't do, and I, you're right, I feel sorry because you know whose fault it's going to be. It's not going to be the Russians' fault. It's not the USA's fault when it starts. It's always Canada. And the papers tomorrow, I can see black mark for Canada. No matter how good we play, they'll jump all over it. It'll be absolutely beautiful how it's always our fault all the time. But the kid was right at the end. A lot of kicking going along in this game, and you don't take kicking. The officials were totally out of control. They lost control. They were out of control themselves, it appeared from here. Are you surprised they simply withdrew from the ice? Because, I mean, this was not a National Hockey League fight where I don't think they go at it 100%. Well, this was a knock-em-down, drag-em-out, pure four brawl. I thought someone might get hurt. Well, what happened? They've never, ever been involved in anything like this before. They, I mean, no... Uh, the referee never saw anything like what he didn't know what was going on he just get off the ice he didn't want to get hurt those guys didn't want to get hurt that's why they get off the ice uh, but they they didn't lose control they never had control of it and again they didn't know what to do all right according to the trainer and, and again we see this like you people do at home it appeared the soviet players left the bench we don't know who's at fault what do you do see the big thing there is the Russians knew they have no chance they're out of it. And you, you're right, you never saw them uh, ever fight before, but they, they, they're smart. I've never said a Russian is dumb. They're not dumb. They've got nothing to lose. They knew that we had to win by five. Have you ever seen them fight back? They were goading our guys all the time, and we do not accept high sticks, we do not uh, uh, spears in the back. It's our Canadian nature not to take that stuff. The Russians were smart, giving them a jab, hoping they'd start something like that. They were the first off the bench, and we fell right into it. And I know it's you, again, you people sitting home in your living rooms, having it all nice and quiet, maybe having a pop or two or a sandwich or something, you see some. How could these fellows do that? You don't know what they've been through over there and what they're going through. So don't say it's a black mark against our players, please. It's a black mark against international hockey. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a black mark against Canada right now because we don't know who started this fight, but it is a black mark against international hockey. What do you do if you're the coach now when you take the players in the dressing room? Well, right away, he's got them under control. Bird will have them under control. They're kids, say, 17 years old, 16 years old. He said, we fell into it, guys. We've got to forget it now. We've got to go out there no matter what they do from here on in. We've got to go out and get those goals because we don't want the silver. We want the gold. Now, I hope he remembers if he gets the, you know, he's four goals. He needs four goals. I hope he remembers near the end of the game and pull that goalie and try to get that fifth goal. All right, Grapes, thank you. Right now, we are going to return live to Piastani in Czechoslovakia. Hopefully, Don Whitman and Sherry Basson can sort out some of the problems that are still going on right now in the arena. Don? 
Well, Brian, I am still absolutely flabbergasted by what I just witnessed here in Piostani, and during that brawl, I must have sounded like it as well, because in international hockey, as we have pointed out, you are not allowed to fight. Now, I think the referee must take some of the responsibility for the incident, because he has allowed a lot of that pushing and shoving to take place, Sherry, following the whistle. There was an incident there, where at the side of the net, a Soviet player came in late, deck Santa Pass, and then they started the skirmish. No, Clyde, there's been some pushing and shoving and stick work and all kinds of little things going on constantly. Now, I, says, I suppose he's saying to himself, i got to let him play. He jumps on that in the first few minutes, you know, they can control it. I'm not kidding on the referees because there's no game without referees right. and we like to blame it and we should be concentrating on our game. There's obviously, they haven't started to flood the ice yet, so they're, they're really, they're, as fly, they're more flabbergasted than we are. We were fairly flabbergasted. There's no question that we're going to get blamed for it. I mean, it's, it's just a fact of life. We have a conduct in the past, and, and we have to deal with that factor. But the issue at hand here is very, very simple. Are they going to play the game? Are they not going to play the game? And if so, who's going to be penalized with this whole thing? And I think that's the committee's dealing with that right now and trying to figure it out. Well, Gunther Zvetsky, I'm sure, is downstairs meeting with the officials. Perhaps if there's a long enough delay, you can sneak out and buy some more crystal. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is something, this is something that is going to put a black mark on Canadian hockey internationally once again. Oh, yes. I'll tell you something. We were talking about computers. I teach at Durham College in Oshawa, and we got a big computer department there. We need them how to figure this out technically because they don't really know who's responsible. We need them for the score after. We need that. Old. They really don't know how to deal with it. I think specifically, never mind the technical aspect of what to do with who. I can't ever recall an international hockey, a bench-clearing incident, even without any fighting. Oh, no, no. I mean, there's no question about it. We saw that pregame fight, and look at how, you know, we saw this pregame fight before the game even started, and we said, hey, what's going on here? And get to settle, and what are they going to do about it? For that little skirmish that Chieson was in and Hartman was in, they gave him one game suspension. I mean, there was some, you know, this was, this could have been called as a 10 rounder. I mean, well, Fred Walker is trying to gather some information down at ice level, trying to get into the respective dressing rooms and also attempting to talk to the officials and determine just what they are going to do. But going back to the incident with the United States, the pregame warm up, the team skating around. And as you saw in our highlight package, it developed at center ice. Lou Nanny, the general manager of the Minnesota North Stars, who was here watching the tournament, watching his son Marty Nanny play for the American team, was still livid. This was two hours after the game when we had dinner with him. He was still talking about the incident and thought it was premeditated. He would probably suggest this might have been premeditated. Hey, no, and I, and we, I was there and you were in support. I don't believe it was premeditated. I believe it was an emotion of the moment, and there's no question that, that, that I feel strong in my heart it wasn't premeditated, especially when we listened to Furry's interview and he talked about the emotion and, and, and the feeling in the dressing room, you know, and, and we talked, to, you know, and Lou's son is involved. Of course, he's going to make some, you know, based on those kind of decisions. I don't think it was premeditated. The I issue is it this. wasn't. Yes, I like to think it was. The very simple issue is, as you as you said also, it doesn't happen very often, and it's never happened that I know of, at least in the recent past history. The fact is, though, it's going to be on every headline, it's going to be on every television, and it's going to be talked by every hockey fan, not only in North America, but especially in Europe and the Eastern countries. This is one incident that I think is going to make national newscasts as well as sportscasts around the world, and certainly headlines in every paper throughout Europe. We'll be back to Piastani and try and sort things out for you after we pause for this message. Canada is leading this hockey game 4-2, to two, but the game was halted nearing the three-quarter part of that second period. A uh, gigantic fracas broke out, and down there, near the Canadian dressing room now, I'm with Bert Templeton, the coach of Team Canada. And Bert, how did it all happen? Well, there was a skirmish in the end, and uh, the Soviet players have been playing uh, relatively aggressively all night. Uh, the referee has not been calling that many penalties, and uh, the Soviet players, uh, I felt, uh, were the first players to start initiating the uh, fisticuffs and swing, which was uh, you know unusual for them, but they played an unusual type hockey game. And it was basically uh, confined to the ice surface uh, when the, uh, you know, the Soviet coach saw fit to send uh, a couple of hockey players off the bench. So when he did that, we were holding our players back, uh, and they were just in front of the bench. 
And uh, then the Soviet team left the bench and uh, the uh, fracas took place. It's an unfortunate incident at any time in any hockey game. It's, a, it's a especially, uh, you know, uh, that way with ourselves because I think uh, it was evident to everybody that we were trying to stay away from that type of thing in the uh, first period. And we, uh, we had taken quite a bit of abuse in the first period without, uh, without retaliation because we felt that uh, if we did re retaliate, we would be playing into their hands. So what we were trying to do was basically, uh, uh, you know, establish ourselves and trying to uh, win the hockey game and get a gold medal and uh, we're still trying to do that if uh, if the game were uh, were to continue now i'm sure that uh, we would be able to go out there and just uh, play hockey it's uh, it's something i have to apologize uh, you know to the people of canada for uh, you know seeing uh, seeing that type of thing is never good but uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, that happened. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, provoked by the Russians. They were the first people to leave the bench, and a uh, from very good source, my assistant coach was at the end of the bench and saw the uh, the Russian coach open the door and actually push one player out. So uh, I thought I felt that they uh, they started it. Uh, they were the first to leave. They started it on the ice. They were the first to leave the bench, and I certainly hope the Canadian team's medal chances is not damaged as a result. When the other uh, when the other opportunity uh, or the other fracas broke out in the Canada U.S. game just before the game started, the coaches went on the ice to try and break it up and to bring the players back. Uh, was there any attempt at all uh, or any thoughts at all of going on the ice this time? Well, it would have been uh, you know life threatening. I think that uh, you know at that particular point, I don't think any referees are definitely uh, supposed to indicate uh, to the uh, coaches that they're supposed to want them on the ice. But I felt that the uh, situation on the ice, that I don't feel that. Uh, myself or Pat would have been able to stop it at that yeah. particular point. Now. Let me bring Pat Burns in, uh, the assistant coach who was down at the end of the bench. Pat, you uh, were by the Soviet coach. Uh, you saw him uh, send players on the ice? Yeah, he opened the door and he did signal for, for some players to, to leave the bench. We, Bert and I tried to hold our players back, but at that point in time, we, we probably weren't used to seeing what was happening around it. We never expected this, this sort of thing, that's for sure. But uh, they, they were definitely the, the, the first to leave the bench, and you know, it's uh, like Bert said, we're going to have to wait the outcome of everything. That's it now. What do you do now? You just sit and wait until they call you back on the ice? Well, as far as we're concerned, uh, we have a hockey game to play. The hockey game is not finished. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're guaranteed a bronze medal right now, but uh, we're looking for gold, and we would like the opportunity to finish the hockey game. Uh, we have actually started nothing. It seemed to be the Soviet style in this hockey game to come out and, and play physical, and uh, and they tried to do that right off the bat. We didn't retaliate and didn't retaliate for for such a long period of time, and, uh, you know, the referee uh, basically maybe uh, we might class as let things get a little bit up of hand until they, until they boil over. Uh, we still want the gold medal and uh, we want the opportunity to win the gold medal and we don't think we've done anything to deserve uh, uh, not being given the opportunity to do so. If they're going to uh, banish some team, then banish the team that, uh, that started, the, uh, started the altercation and left the bench. Okay, let's talk about Canada's situation right now. Your players are in the dressing room. If they decide to proceed with the game, what do you tell your players? Well, it's not if they decide. Uh, I can't see, uh, I'm not even think, uh, thinking of the possibility or not, but... Uh, well, let me interject. First of all, fighting means automatic banishment. I mean, everybody was out fighting. Well, I don't know if they call it fighting. I've seen international hockey where they call it uh, five minutes for roughing. Uh, I, don't, I really don't know what the international rules are governing this. Uh, I would certainly think that uh, we should be given the opportunity to go back on the ice and play, and we're all prepared to go out there and play the game of hockey. We were trying to play the high game of hockey, uh, we were trying to stay out of the altercations. We took far more abuse in this hockey game than what we had before without retaliation because we knew that the Russians had nothing to lose going into this hockey game and Canada had everything to lose and what we wanted to do was stay out of trouble, see if we could uh, get them into penalty trouble and capitalize and, and win a gold medal. Our hopes are still that way and that's what we're hoping to do. Okay, Bert, we'll check back with you later. You and Pat, uh, Bert Dambleton, Pat Burns, thank you very much for joining us during this time out this brief break let's go back upstairs now and we'll check in with Don and Sherry well Fred Bert Templeton said that the Soviets had nothing to lose indeed they have nothing to lose Canada has a medal to lose the color still to be determined they may not get that chance Sherry we have been informed that the directors are now meeting Gunther Savetsky the president they just paged the general manager of the United States team to a meeting and the word we have received is that both teams might be disqualified. Uh, there's no question that that's part of the subject. Uh, and, and that's precisely why they called that meeting. And uh, if, in fact, they make that decision, they'll disqualify Canada and Russia. 
and therefore Kennedy goes right out of the middle run, and of course Russia's got nothing to lose, as Bert Temple alluded to. And, uh, you know, we talked about earlier when we were preparing for this telecast about how the change in style of the Russians, how they've been studying our, our films and so forth, how they've gone to some big aggressive wingers, and they certainly have, and guys that can skate, how they try to play the corners and so forth. There was a lot of stuff after the whistle. A lot of stuff that usually, you know, we, we, we try to discipline, we talk about action, reaction. And, and as we alluded to earlier, if they'd have jumped on that, I don't think we'd have had the problem that we have here right now. The other thing is, they haven't attempted to flood the ice at all. So what we're saying here, very simple, is this. Is that, you know, what, what I expect to see is, is that I'd like to see them finish the hockey game. That's what should be done. We should concentrate on that. Flood the ice right now, add this minutes to the minutes that are remaining in the third period, and let's get the tournament over with. Well, you know, people always talk about violence in hockey. They condemn our North American hockey and the National Hockey League because of the fighting. In international hockey, there is more stick work, and we have been witness to it, more slashing, more spearing, more kicking, more tripping, because they are not permitted to fight. Disqualification results from a fight. Now, I'm not condoning fighting, no. but uh, international hockey is very chippy play at times. I think we saw evidence of that tonight leading up to the major brawl that erupted. We'll be back in Pia Stanley, but right now, let's go to the studio and hear our Brian and Grace. All right, Don Whitman, an ugly, disgraceful incident. I'm watching it in our Toronto Control Center like you people are at home. What concerned me was the total lack of control by the officials as they pulled off the ice. This was a down-and-out Pier 4 brawl, folks. This is not a National Hockey League fight where players don't get hurt. I was greatly concerned that some young man would be severely injured. I don't think disgraceful incident is too strong a term. Don Cherry? Well... That's what happens when you get in the fight, Brian. Somebody can get hurt. You know, that's why you no, get no, in no, the fight. No, no, but we talked about uh, this. this. This was an ugly fight. Well, let me just put it this way to you. The Russians sent his players on. What? And there were their whole players were out there. We had uh, five guys out there, six guys out there. And say about 18 guys were beaten up in five. What would you think of Burt Templeton? He had to send the guys on. The guy, that, the, peop, the team that goes on first, is the team, I've always said this in the National Hockey League too, I've always said this, the team that goes on first should the team that should really be racked. All right, we're going to see a highlight. Hold it for just a minute, fellas. Don, I'm not laying blame because we weren't there. What I am saying was this was a vicious fight. The officials were out of control. I'm surprised someone didn't get hurt. Well, they, they, yeah, I know you saw all that they're fighting and everything, but as you saw, most of the guys had their gloves on. I mean, some of them didn't know, the Russians didn't know how to fight. All the Russians going out to fight, they were fighting with their gloves on. How are you going to get hurt? They were pawing at one another. Why well, it looked bad, they were wrestling around. The worst part of the whole thing was one of our guys had a Russian, and as the Russian went down, he kicked him in the stomach. Now that stuff, that guy should really get it. We're never going to agree on this. The Russians I, I'm not saying it's good. Fight, I'm not saying it's great, but somebody could have got hurt. Absolutely. All right, Don, that's let's take a look at the incident that supposedly started this brawl tonight in Piastani. Here it is, Don. Well, I think it starts when they, the Russian goalie makes the save, and one of our guys came in. It's been going on and on, a little shot. This is where, well, I don't know, a little right shot right here. here. But it, just before that, a little shot, yeah, I see him, he knocks him down. What's the matter with that? There was nothing wrong with that. A little check. Now what happens? Now the guy comes in and gives the guy a little shot. Now, that wasn't much. You see the Russian take the first shot and knock our guy down. Now, there you are. There it is, right there. There's 12 pointing at him. He did it. Now, what are you supposed to do to that? There was the guy was standing there. The guy gave him a shot, knocked him down. So, what are you supposed to do? We got an interesting call, Don, from a viewer, uh, Don Whitman and Sherry Basson, saying this is the first time they can recall this happening in international hockey. A viewer has called our control center here in Toronto, saying that the Soviets were involved in a bench-clearing brawl with the Czechoslovakian team in 1978, two years ago in 1984 with the Americans, and both those fights occurred in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Well, like I said earlier, the Russians got nothing to lose. They're laughing. I mean, this was, this was planned. There's no doubt about it. The Russian coach, he, he never fed his players for a couple of days. He'll be drinking uh, uh, water and bread in Siberia after this game. But he's got nothing to, he's got nothing to lose. Send him out, have a little thing. Canada's going to, I'll tell you, Canada's going to end up in the short end of this, I'll tell you. 
I'll tell you something. Whichever team left the bench first, the coach is definitely to blame Absolutely. because in international hockey, we should explain again to the viewers, the players have to go past the coach to get to the ice. That's, that's the old story. I remember when I was over there in uh, 80 in, in Sweden, they told me that I had to have the bench in the back and I had to stand in front. We went and got screwdrivers, ripped the thing up, put it in front and stood in back. Because if you've noticed, during the game, the Canadian uh, team is always standing up next to the boards looking out. So you have them for two hours standing up looking over the boards. You should always have, you should take those benches up for you coaches that ever go over them again. Take them up, put them, stand back like we do, and the guys can hop over and away they go. Sure, it's the Russians' fault. Absolutely. You send the guy on first, he's the guy that should pay. All right, Don, it is 4-2 for our Canadian juniors over the Soviet Union. I don't care who started it. An ugly, disgraceful incident has disrupted this hockey game. Stay with us. Sports Weekend will continue live right after these messages. <laughs> Back at the Piastani Ice Hall, we are just hearing an announcement from Gunter Sobetsky, the president of the International Ice Hockey Federation. He has just said this game is complete. It is over. It will probably go into the books now as a 0-0 tie, and that would mean that Canada would finish with the bronze, third place bronze medal. We just heard the announcement moments ago here. They decided behind closed doors, the officials of the International Ice Hockey Federation were meeting. They were talking to Dennis McDonald, the director of operations of Team Canada, and they were talking to other Canadian officials. It was speculated that that could be the case. Had it not happened, you could have bet one thing for sure, and that would have been that the Finnish team would have raised holy heck here had the game proceeded, because by international rules, any kind of fighting means automatic banishment for this game and any others that do follow it. However, under the present conditions here, there would have been no players left to go on the ice to finish the game. So, International Ice Hockey Federation President Dr. Gunter Savetsky has decided that it is no contest, and that means Canada, Don and Sherry wind up in third place and the bronze medal. Back upstairs to you. All right, Fred, well, they met for 35 minutes, and I'm not at all surprised, Sherry Bassett, at the decision that was arrived at, because as we stated, when the incident broke out, international rules call for automatic disqualification of any player who fights. Obviously, every player was involved on both sides. Both teams had to lose everybody on the ice. The fans are very disenchanted because they only see a half a hockey game and a good hockey and game. a real good hockey game. game. The very simple thing is that this is precedent setting without question. And the CBC cameras were here to see it. They got Canada got a first clip set. I think that that's exactly Brett really put it in a nutshell. They had a situation to look at. According to the rules, what are we going to do? If we continue this game, we got a gold medal at stake. Finland is sitting in the driver's they seat. They would have caused an they, international you know, incident. What's going to happen here? And I think that they were trying to bounce the balls, and that's what they came up for. The unfortunate fact is, is that Canada was playing a good hockey game. We're only a couple of goals away at getting really in the hunt that had a lead in this game. We're, we're really concentrating, putting some pressure on, doing some good things, getting technically the inside chances that we talked about. Everything seemed to go for them, and bang, oh, the ship fell apart. If some humor can be injected into such an incident, I might add that during the 35 to 40 minutes that we have been filling from Piastani trying to find out what is going on, our friends from Czechoslovakia and television cut back to the studio and they were showing a circus act, a dog act to be precise. <laughs> it may have been an appropriate commentary. I guess they figure a circus here and a circus there. What the heck? Let's let everybody see a circus. Well, it is indeed unfortunate for the Canadian team and those young men behind that Canadian dressing room door have to be tremendously disappointed. They had been playing a sound hockey game. They had been working hard. They had a silver medal, almost certainly. It looked as though they did have a shot at the gold medal. They are going to go home without either of those. Well, Don, I've sat in that dressing room. And I know what the emotions are all well. about, and you've covered it. And you were as emotional and professional in your job doing that. But I tell you, when you're sitting back there now, and they make a decision in a boardroom that affects your shot for that gold medal, where you put your heart into it, and if you're emo and when the game without emotion, this is an example of it just taking an extra step. You got to play it with emotion. I mean, it's not a tic-tac-toe. It's not a mechanical game. It's a team sport, and if you don't play it with feeling, you know, it's not. It's not played by robots. 
and uh, you can be rest assured in there that they feel they had a shot at it. They made a great recovery from that loss to the Czechs. Give them credit. A young team that was molding, had a shot at the gold, and as you pointed out, had the silver in their hand, and now we're, uh, we, we expect that they're getting the bronze. There is some speculation that if they're thrown right out of the tournament that Sweden moves into the bronze. That really would destroy some of those young men when they know what they've given. They've given their heart, not only for the team and the country, and I don't want to really make this a mishmash about it, but it is emotional. You are representing your country, and if you don't get that feeling when they raise that flag and play that national anthem, hey, you don't have any blood pressure, I'll tell you that. Well, we can reflect back to the performance by the Canadian team when they won the gold medal in 1982. The young players standing on the blue line in the arena Graham Arena in Rochester, Minnesota. They didn't have a recording of O Canada, so the players sang O Canada. They stood on the blue line singing O Canada, and what a proud moment that was. You were there. And then in 1985, you uh, had the opportunity to win another gold medal in Helsinki, Finland. But you have to really feel for these young Canadian players because they rebounded from that 5-1 loss to Czechoslovakia last Monday. As a matter of fact, there were many National Hockey League scouts we were in conversation with. We felt the same way, suggesting that Canada might not win another game in the tournament after they played Poland. But they came back and played so well against the United States, Sweden, and again tonight against the Soviet Union, all for naught. Let's go down to ice level, and here's Fred Walker. Well, John, as I was speculating earlier, Canada will not wind up with the bronze medal. In fact, the news is even worse than that. And with me is the Director of Operations of Team Canada, Dennis McDonald. Dennis, what is the verdict? Well, basically, uh, the Directorate has met and they have decided that both Canada and the Soviet Union are no longer uh, eligible for any of the awards in the tournament. And all of their points, wins and losses, will be struck from the records and they are now looking at the uh, new medal winners. This is a black mark on the eye of junior hockey. There's no question it's a real setback and uh, something that is a, a, a real tragedy, I think, for hockey, not only in Canada, but internationally. We had established such a good relationship over here with our style of play in the last three or four years with our national teams, and this will uh, certainly take a lot of time to erase. Let's just set the scenario for a moment, because you went behind closed doors with members of the International Ice Hockey Federation. What was the discussion about? Well, basically, the recommendation right off the top was to suspend the two teams. Uh, and uh, I guess in my heart, I had somewhat the same feelings. However, uh, in looking at the discussion itself, I felt that there was some uh, uh, possibility that individual uh, penalties could have been given out in a, in a severe fashion, uh, and the game could have suspend, uh, continued as it normally would at home. Certainly the people that were the key instigators in the fight around the goal net and the people that led the charge from the bench could have been dealt with, and then uh, the game could have continued. But the rest of the people at the IHF feel that uh, this is a, such a black mark on the uh, hockey scene in Europe and uh, that they must, in this sense, make the penalty very, very severe. And uh, every one of them was in agreement on that court. Where do you go from here? What's next now? Well, I think we really have to evaluate what we had here from the start to the finish and where it got off the road, where the, uh, where the uh, responsibility was, and just how we can get it uh, back on track and what kind of uh, uh, leadership we need all the way through the program. Are there likely to be other suspensions? I, in other words, next year's tournament? Well, that is a possibility because this will be discussed at the IHF meetings in Vienna and one of the considerations would be whether the Soviets or Canada should be allowed to cons continue in the April in the next year. That was brought up, but it was not discussed at this time. Well, we'll keep in touch. Dennis McDonald, thank you very much. Thank Dennis you. McDonald, the Director of Operations of Team Canada. Now, we'll be back at the World Junior Hockey Championship in one minute from now. Looking at the assistant Canadian coach, uh, very, very disappointed. Both teams, that is Pat Burns, have been disqualified, as they should be from this World Junior Tournament, for an ugly incident as rotten a brawl as you will ever see in hockey. You know, reacting to some of the things said in Czechoslovakia a few minutes ago, I realize these young men feel badly about this, but that's not the point. 
they should all be thrown out of this tournament because the rules of international hockey are very, very clear. There is no fighting. Don Cherry is in our Toronto Control Studio with me. He obviously does not agree with me. We have had literally hundreds of calls from you people from British Columbia to Newfoundland all the way up to the Yukon wanting to see the beginning of this fight. Now, we're not glorifying fighting. We're not going to play the entire brawl. But journalistically, I think it is right to go back and take a look at where it appeared that this fight started. If we can roll that video tape, well, Don Cherry, let's have one more look at the incident right. which happened about 45 minutes ago. I don't know where you say appeared, Brian. I don't know where you get that. Look, we've cleaned the ice and everything. We're going. Now watch, they're going in the corner here. And before, while they get a roll, I'm just saying Canadian kids will not take what comes up. We've been brought up not with a slap in the face and a punch in the nose. We do not take stuff like this. Now what? He didn't do anything. He just went to the guy, watch him get up and punch him with a nice left right to the thing. Now who started the fight? Now who, what are you supposed to do? Since we're three or four years old, we do not take punches in the mouth like that. All right, calm down. Let's keep... And by the way, wait a minute, keep the pit. Yeah. Okay, we're going to see it again. And by the way, when we went off this here the last time, I told you Gunnar Schmunner would give us and we'd come out the short end. Did I not say that? Everybody was talking the game. It's not a going. matter of coming out in the short end. Both teams should be thrown out of I'm the I'm not talking about right. that. Whose fault is it? I'm getting here black mark because you know Canada will get blamed for this. Canada will get blamed for it. The Russians won't get blamed. You know that. It's coming up here. There's no question that both teams should be blamed for this incident. Regardless Wait. of who started it, John, there's no justifying I'm going to shock people out there. I'm going to shock people out there and I'm going to say it because I want to say it. They asked me on here, I'm going to say it. If I had a bit coach in there, and Bert's going to take a lot of heat from this. Bert Templeton's going to take a lot of heat. He never had them under control. I will say this. If he hadn't sent his players over there when 19 Russians were out there,